As we promised this morning, we are going to look at the second part of Paul's uh, writing where he explains to us what God said to him about all the things that had happened in his life and why he could be not only a Christian, but he could be an apostle of Jesus Christ. God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And we looked at that this morning, looking at the five ways that God's grace is sufficient for the salvation, not only of someone of the caliber of the Apostle Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus, all the bad things that he had done, all the baggage he brought with him, if it's the grace of God is sufficient to save the Apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus, it's sufficient to save each and every one of us. But God goes on to say that His uh, strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God's strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. God could call the strongest people in the world to do His will. And what then would be the account of it? Well, simply that a strong person, a smart person, a rich person, or someone with the greatest talent in whatever field he is in, was able to do something. But don't we expect strong people to be able to do feats of strength? And rich people to do really good things and a lot of good things with their money? You know, uh, Bill Gates and all of those are rich. You know, they're always talking about how much money they give away, but don't we expect it from someone like that? <coughs> But when God uses someone who is weak, someone who has a problem, someone who's not strong, someone who's not rich, someone who's not pretty, someone who has all kinds of problems to do His will, then the only answer that anybody can give to what's going on is that's the grace of God working in that person's life. So the strength of God is made perfect in our weaknesses. And because of that, it gives us no excuse not to trust in God, obey God, and do God's will. Because the very weakest of us, God can bring to strength and make His will come to fruition in their lives. What I want to do is look at a statement in Hebrews chapter 11 as we start off. Verse 32. We know Hebrews 11 is the honor roll of faith. All those Old Testament characters who, uh, by the grace of God, did wonderful, fantastic, marvelous, and sometimes miraculous things. Well, look what he says in verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fall, I'm sorry, would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. There just wasn't enough time, so to speak, there wasn't enough space for the writing that the writer of the book of Hebrews could continue on and tell us about such people as these. So I want to take that time this evening to look at three of the characters mentioned here and demonstrate why they are so very important for our understanding of, of that phrase that God, His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. Consider first of all a man by the name of Gideon. And if you have your Bibles open, turn back. We're not going to do a lot of reading, but Judges chapter 6 through chapter 8. Judges 6 through 8. And there you have the story of Gideon. <coughs> but what I want you to understand in the circumstances that were going on in Israel at the time, remember in the Judges, they'll follow God for a little while. Then Israel will sin. They'll start worshiping other gods. God will withdraw His protection, send a, a foreign nation against them to punish them, to chastise them, to get them to come back and to trust in God. 
And then he'll send a deliverer to take care of that nation as they begin to repent. And they'll serve God for a little while and then get back into the same cycle. Much to the degree that we see in the history of the church. There are cycles there when the church is going strong and then it falls for a little bit. It goes strong and it falls for a little bit. So we can understand those cycles. But go back and look who God chooses in many instances to show his strength. And here's this man by the name of Gideon. He lives in a time of great despair for Israel. And it's very bad. And it seems very bad for him because his own father in the community where he lives has the little piece of land that is a grove with trees that are cut in the likenesses of the gods so that the town people, townspeople can go there and worship. <coughs> Not to worship the God of heaven, but to worship the gods of the nations surrounding them. That seems to be a source of the problem here and why God is forsaking them at this particular time. And when we pick up the story there in, he, in, in Judges chapter 6, we find that Gideon is out in a wine press threshing wheat. Now, I'm not the smartest fellow on agriculture, but you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. A wine press is a hole that's dug down into the earth. And they press the grapes up here and the juice runs down into the bottom and they collect it and they use it. But that's not suitable for a threshing floor, so to speak. You want a place that's open where you can beat that wheat and the wind blows the chaff away. It's not going to happen down in that wine press. But well, why in the world is he doing this? He's doing this because he's afraid. He's doing this because there, there's a great fear of the enemy. And the enemy has been raiding them. The Midianites have come in and, and done a lot of damage. And every time they thresh wheat, the Midianites have come and take it. So he has to hide to be able to thresh the wheat in order for them simply to have bread to survive. When the Lord told Gideon to deliver Israel, Gideon used a common excuse. Look at verse 15 of that sixth chapter. <coughs> Judges chapter 6, verse 15. So he, that's Gideon, said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. We're the smallest clan, and I'm the smallest one in the family. I'm the least important of the least important of the least important of the least important. And of course, the tribes of Manasseh. Remember that Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph. And the two of them got a double portion because of Joseph when it came to the land distribution. But half the tribe of Manasseh didn't want to go into the promised land. They wanted to stay over on the east side of the Jordan River in what's known as Gilead. Uh, Gad, I can't even think of the third tribe, I'm sorry. But Gad and, and uh, the half tribe of Manasseh, there was another tribe, they stayed over there. That's where they wanted to be because it was good for farming. It was good for grazing. But when it came down to it, that was the first part of Israel that was always overrun. That was the first place that was always in trouble. That was the first place that typically fall into idolatry. Now this may have been in the, the half-tribe of Manasseh that, that was actually in the Promised Land. But here again, we have that point. We're just weak. I'm not very important. I'm not a leader. I'm not someone who should be doing this. You need to go and talk to those people down in Judah. Or you need to talk to those people in Ephraim. You know, there are some pretty important people there. And they are leaders. And they can 
help in this type of a situation? We're poor. We're poor, so we can't do this. And we're poor, so we can't do that. God doesn't call the rich people to do important things, does he? Not all the time. Some, some of the Bible characters are rich. We talked about that this morning. But so often, being rich is an impediment. We talked about the rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. His wealth was an impediment. He wasn't going to trust God because he had these riches. And if he had to get rid of those riches, you know, he couldn't place as much trust in God or as much trust in Jesus as he did his riches. So he went away sorrowful. He wasn't going to do anything. But here's a poor man who says, I'm poor, so I can't do anything. So what is it? The rich man can't do anything. The poor man can't do anything. And you know, that's exactly right. Because without God, we can't do anything. But when God is on our side and we're obeying God, we can do whatever God would have us to do. When, uh, and with Gideon, after Gideon is finally persuaded to get to the work, he had some moral challenges to overcome the first thing, didn't he? Because the first thing he had to do was become an iconoclast. That is a big word. What do you mean by iconoclast? Well, an icon are those images. Okay? Just a little different word for them. And someone who is an iconoclast is one who goes in and tears up those images. He had to go to his father's farm, to that grove, and he had to tear down those images. And he took his father's oxen and he took a plow and he plowed it over and under and, and all and burnt that stuff. And then he took the plow and he used that to uh, start a fire on an altar and offered the oxen as a sacrifice to God. First thing he had to do was show whose side he was on. That he was on God's side. Now, it, it's pretty hard for rich people to give up a plow and some oxen. But here's a poor family. And the first thing he offers is something that's going to help them, his poor family. There goes the plow. There goes the oxen. But what are the townspeople concerned about? Well, look what he did. He cut down the gods. He tore down the gods. And he go to his father. What are you going to do with him? Now, finally, his father says, you know, if those gods are gods, They'll speak, they'll act, they'll do something, they'll punish him. But they didn't. They didn't. One man, a weak man, a poor man, standing up, and God uses him, God blesses him, and Gideon then drives the Midianites out of Israel. And he saves, in a physical sense, the whole nation. He drives them out. And, and remember the sword of Gideon? Go back and read the story about it. And do you know what the people wanted to do with Gideon after he drove the Midianites out? They wanted to take and make him a king. Now, that would be hard for a poor person to resist, wouldn't it? But he knew that wasn't God's will. He knew that wasn't what was supposed to be did his work for God, and he was satisfied with that. And what a wonderful story that is of God using someone who was poor, someone who was weak, in a strong way to redeem his people, to deliver his people. Now the second person, Barak. I get so used to saying Barak anymore. I used to say Barak all the time. We'll say Barak. And this is in Judges chapter 4. And again, uh, Israel is in a heap of trouble. There's always been a war off and on. But now it's the Canaanites, the people who live right there next to them. And a lot of them are the people that they hadn't driven out like they were supposed to in the first place. And if you go back to the book of Joshua, you'll see those places. There were some that they made peace treaties with. Yeah, we'll enslave these people. Now, God didn't want it that way. That wasn't what God said. That's what the people did. And they made treaties with some of them. 
Now here they are. They're rising up. They're causing problems with Israel. And, then, and it's King Jabin and his captain Sisera there in verse 2. Now there's a prophetess who's judging Israel in that time. And you might say, oh, wait a minute. Why is a woman judging Israel? Well, if you read through the whole thing, very simply, the men are not acting like men of God. So God raises up a woman to lead them to a degree, to judge them, and to shame them for not standing up like men, like men of God. Now by inspiration, Deborah calls Barak to lead 10,000 men to battle against Sisera. And she prophesies that the enemy would be delivered into his hands. And his response is, I'll go. But Deborah, you got to go with me. I won't go if you don't go, Deborah. I won't, it's kind of like, I won't go if you don't go hold my hand. I, I won't go if you're not there. Just be with me and, and, and to encourage me all the way. So Deborah finally relents. She goes with him. But she says the victory, for the glory of the victory, will not go to Barak. It'll go to a woman. Because he, even in that circumstance, failed to stand up and act like a man of God, a man for God's people. <coughs> Excuse me. So they go. God gives them this great battle, or this victory. It's under Barak's leadership. But it's Jael, a woman by the name of Jael, Jael who is the hero of it all. See, in the battle, Jabin is killed. Sisera runs. And as Sisera runs, he goes to a certain person's tent, and this person is basically this, the man whose tent it is. He's kind of non-committed to which side he's going to be on. So he thinks, it's all right, I can run there, I can be safe, because that's a neutral party there. And he goes in, and J.L. is there. And J.L. says, yeah, you can hide in here, and I'll get you something to drink, you know, and all, and all. Hey, lay your head down and rest. You'll be safe here. And when he lays down, he falls asleep. She takes a tent peg and drives it through his temples, nailing him to the ground. She gets the glory. She stood up where others wouldn't. But yet Barak has something there. There's something there for him. Look at verses 23 and 24 of chapter 4. So on that day God subdued Jabin king of Canaan in the presence of the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. God gave them a victory. It was not as great as it could have been for Barak, but yet finally there was someone who would go, even with those limitations. So God used a man whose weakness was his fear to subdue a whole nation. To subdue a nation. God took that weakness, fear, in Barak and turned it into a great now the third example we're going to look at is David. And 1 Samuel 17 is where we really look at this and begin with it. Or I guess 16 and 17 is, is, would be better. David is a great example of God overcoming weakness to show his strength. And in chapter 16, Samuel's come to Jesse's house. He's going to uh, anoint the next king of Israel. God has already, he's, God's come to the conclusion Saul is not working out. Of course, God knew he wasn't going to work out. God had given them a king after the white nations around them, a king who was going to do various bad things to them. And Saul turns out that way. He starts off kind of good. He looks like a king. He's 
tall. He's head and shoulders above everybody else in the kingdom. He's a fighter. He's a warrior. He's smart. He's got all these things going for him. But yet in Saul's case, Saul is a very jealous type of person. And he doesn't like anybody getting the glory except him. And that's not the way it was supposed to be in Israel. God was going to give them a king after his own heart. And now Samuel has come to anoint that king, a man after God's own heart. So uh, even David's own father didn't think he was going to be the one to be king because he was just a young man in his teen years, just a stripling is what he's called. He'd take a piece of bacon and flap it around. That's kind of what you get the picture of a stripling. And that's David. He's out tending the sheep. And as Samuel goes through each of Jesse's sons, and he looks at him and says, there's a good-looking, handsome, strong, big guy. Surely that's the one. God says, no. The next one, oh, yeah, that'd be a good king. No. All the way down through, and finally, there's, there's none left there. And, and Samuel says, don't you have another son? Well, yeah, there's David, but he's just a kid. Samuel says, send for him. And he brings Samuel in, and God says, that's the one. Because God wasn't looking at the outside. God was looking at the inside. Weakness? Meekness? Well, there was some pride to a degree with David. David wasn't afraid to go up against Goliath, was he? He made some boasts. I did this, I did this, and I'll do that. But notice his boasts were always with God's help, I can do it. So if our God looks at someone at that young age and says, that's a man after my heart. He's going to grow into the person that I need to lead these people, to be the king. And, and not just to be the king, but to establish a dynasty that's going to last for about a thousand years. Israel and Judah. But it's because of David's trust. His trust. I can face Goliath if God is with me. I can face the Philistines in battle if God is with me. I can face the Amalekites if God is with me. I can face Saul and I can put up with Saul chasing me all over the place if God is with me. I can lose a whole bunch of stuff if God is with me. And God was with me. Matthew chapter 19. Excuse me. Verses 13 and 14. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. That's Jesus. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little ones come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. In that weakness of little children, God can find some great strength. And his strength is perfected. Talk to some of the children that you see. Ask them about God. They're not afraid to talk about God. They're not afraid to talk about right and wrong. Sometimes they don't have the knowledge. But there's a lot of wisdom that's there. And out of the mouths of babes sometimes comes truths that, that just kind of set us back. How could they understand such things? Well, what's the key? Well, the key with children is humility, forgiveness, and trust. They're humble. They look up to everybody, don't they? Forgiveness? Yeah. They have a fight with their friend, and what are they doing a half an hour later? Blame the friend. It's all forgotten. It's forgiven. It's over. And trust. Tell them something. 
They trust adults mostly, and anymore we're telling them don't trust any adult, but, but yeah, they, they will trust adults, and especially if your trust has been proven to them. That's what God desires in us. He desires in us to be humble people, to humble ourselves in the sight of God so that He can lift us up, so that He can use us in His kingdom. No, no use for excuses. God doesn't have time for that. I, I remember one of those parables. I think it was a parable of the talent where somebody starts making excuses. Well, there's a couple different ones. Excuses. Weaknesses. Forgiveness. Hey, if we're merciful, God will be merciful to us. Trust. Trust in Him enough to obey Him. God says, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. In your weakness, in my weakness, God is made strong and His strength is able to work because of us. Because it's not expected of us. It's not expected that we would stand up. It's not expected that we would do these things. Because we humble ourselves. God can use us. We naturally try to hide our weaknesses, hoping that others will think that we are strong. Typically, don't we? But when it comes down to doing the Lord's work, oh no, I, I'm weak. I can't do that. I don't have the resources. I don't have this. I don't have that. We, we really act the opposite when it comes to the work of the church comes to worshiping and serving God. So we should glory in our infirmities as the Apostle Paul did, knowing that our weaknesses, our, our true weaknesses are what's going to make the difference and give God the opportunity to work through us to further broaden the borders of his kingdom. Thank you for your time for listening to you have need. We ask that you come take us into the business and